All right, thanks. Really excited to be talking here at B-Sides virtually. So um, if you haven't gone over to the Crypto Puzzles channel in Slack, uh, highly encourage you to do so. If you're coming here from the Crypto Puzzle channel in Slack, you might get some hints on the, the puzzle listening to the talk. So here we are to talk about modern symmetric encryption. So hiding important messages sent between two people. It's been a goal of people from as far back as second grade. It might actually go back a little bit farther. In 1500 BC, a Mesopotamian potter encrypted the method for making his pottery glaze and inscribed it on a clay tablet. This would have been really important information for him and valuable as a tradesman. So the added effort of protecting the method for waterproofing and decorating his pottery totally makes sense. Ancient Hebrew people also made use of encryption using a substitution cipher to encode the names of their enemies in parts of the Bible as early as the 600s BC. By the time the Roman Empire took over the Greeks in population and power, Julius Caesar improved the speed of encryption algorithms by taking each letter in a message and shifting it forward three places. Later, his nephew Augustus modified the cipher and instead of shifting messages three places, only shifted them forward one letter. I guess three was a little too hard. By 1467, rather than encrypting just one letter at a time, encryption schemes started using two block letters and, and keys based on words or phrases rather than a rotation of just a, a number from one to 25 like the Caesar cipher. This brought an important feature to enciphered messages. Previously, any one of the plain text letters always in, translated to the same cipher letter, but now there's lots more plain text possibilities for every letter in the cipher text, making decryption much harder. World War II is often considered by many the start of modern cryptography. With the advent uh, of the use of machines rather than by hand calculations. These cipher machines allowed for more complex ciphers to be executed faster and prevented calculations designed to break encryption from being effectively done by hand. So, various cipher designers from different countries contrived several machines for use in wartime, and many continued the use of the improved versions of these cipher machines until the advent of modern computing systems, which brought about the ability to greatly impact the effectiveness of those cipher machines. At the same time, cipher machine security was being improved and their internal complications increased. Mathematical advances in the field of cryptography likewise moved forward. During the first half century, or during the half century following World War II, increase it increased research into cryptography from both private companies and public universities, and that research continued at an ever-accelerating pace. Since it was critical for a war, limits were imposed on the now much stronger cryptography. These cryptographic systems were restricted from export from the U.S. and put in the category with nuclear bombs design and even horses, which probably came from a a much earlier era. This is the landscape that bore the data encryption standard, or DES, or DES, which is now considered woefully inadequate. It could have been better though. Its original design had twice the key size, but ended up getting curtailed by NSA's tweaks to the algorithm prior to standardization. The restrictions on cryptography were relaxed a little bit in the 90s, when the government realized that it was a lost battle, largely due to the efforts of international publishers and open source enthusiasts. In the mid-90s, Triple DES was standardized publicly, and another cipher called RC4 was leaked to the public. And then nearing the 2000s, NIST announced that they would create an advanced encryption standard, better known simply as AES, and open up submissions for that to the world. Textbooks and cryptography classes and online examples have been created to explain those algorithms, triple DES, RC4, and AES. And depending on the level, of course, explanations of the ciphers can range from extremely simple, like this, or go 
down to the full cipher detail, down to each individual byte, like this, or this, or put into a more fun format, like this one. The problem is, whenever you start trying to explain the algorithm at that level, you end up looking like this. Each of these two different explanations are useful depending on the level of understanding that you need. The problem comes when you try to extrapolate out of either just that deep knowledge or the very shallow knowledge with no additional context, you end up with insecure systems. These systems could be nearly anything encrypting data, databases, application storage, transport mechanisms protecting data sent over the air. In this talk, I want to take the road in between these two views in order to give you a better understanding of what the current best practices are for safely encrypting data. Before we get too far though, there is a little bit of background knowledge you need to get the most out of this talk. First, it's important to understand that there's two main types of symmetric key ciphers, block ciphers and stream ciphers. Both of these types have an output indistinguishable from random noise as long as the algorithm is cryptographically secure. Both DES and AES are examples of block ciphers by design. And then RC4 and Salsa20 are both stream ciphers. These block ciphers operate over chunks of data. They take the data, break it into blocks to operate over, and the stream ciphers, on the other hand, generate a stream of randomness to combine with a message. The combining here is done using a logical XOR, which looks at a pair of bits and then sets the bit or marks down a one as the answer if the inputs are different, and then doesn't set or puts a zero if both of the inputs are the same. The way I was taught about XOR was it's one or the other, but not both. One of the cool properties of XOR is that it's fully commutative. So if you think of columns A and B and the answer as cups in a cup and balls trick, then to set a bit, you can put a ball onto a cup. So we'll set cup A and B, which means that the answer, because A and B are the same, is not set. So now we can take these three cups and then swish them around into every different position. And no matter what, the equation's still true. No matter how you mix up the cups, math holds. This is the math behind what a stream cipher does. Now, those previous iterations, they went through all but one of the rows in that truth table we saw two slides ago. The last one is if both A and B are not set, and that means you don't set the answer cup either. And of course, at this point, you can still slide all the cups around without changing the truth of this equation. The random stream of data used with ciphers goes back to a really old idea described in 1882 by Frank Miller used in securing the telegram. The idea was further developed in 1917 by somebody from Bell Labs in conjunction with the US Army Signal Corps. The idea was to have a really, really long random striper cipher or a, a one-time pad as a key, and then combine that with the message. A ma famous mathematician named Claude Shannon was working at Bell Labs, and he mathematically proved that a one-time pad, if it was truly random, the cipher is completely unbreakable. The goal of these stream ciphers is to approximate the idea of that. By generating a pseudo-random stream of data, it looks random, but it was generated through a repeatable process, and then combining that with a message to produce ciphertext. One of the best things about XOR is that commutative property. And once you have the ciphertext, by rearranging these, like the cups and balls, you can recreate the random stream. If you can recreate that random stream by using like a keyed stream cipher or a really long one-time pad, you can XOR the ciphertext and the random stream together and get the plain text message back. So now let's quickly turn to block ciphers. Uh, this algorithm takes in data and a key and then outputs an array of random looking bits. Now, if you remember earlier, that overly simplistic diagrams can be dangerous if you try to combine it without the knowledge in a greater context. Here's why. Block ciphers have security properties that are really desirable. They promise that with a secret key, a message goes in, random data comes out. It's exactly what we want. But what if the message going to the block is the same every single time? The output every single time is also the same. But good news, 
each block of output is very random looking, but only if you look at each block by itself. One example of this effect was created by a student as part of a, a class paper and then added to the block cipher page of Wikipedia. This uh, cool idea was greatly improved by Filippo Valdestora in 2013 with a cool pop art rendition of it. Of course, understanding the effect of this, because you can see that the background of the penguin, although encrypted, you can definitely tell there's a penguin there. The cryptographers understood this and told people never use this mode of block ciphers from the beginning. And some cryptographic APIs like Java's helpfully made it the default. Microsoft's .NET API has a different default that's a little bit safer. It's called chaining block cipher mode or CBC mode. This was a concept in, developed back in 1976. The mode prevents this penguin problem by taking the ciphertext output from the previous block and XORing it with the input to the next block. CBC mode is further improved by adding another input, one that gets passed along with the ciphertext or it's agreed upon before beginning any of the encryption. Input's called an, an initialization vector and commonly is abbreviated IV. And depending on the protocol, this IV is combined somehow into the initial state of the cipher so encrypting the same message over and over with the same key, but with a different IV, can produce a different output as well. Because the IV is an input to the encryption function at the start, and it's not related to the key or the ciphertext, it's considered a public value and can be sent or stored alongside the ciphertext. CBC mode was used in protocols like TLS for many, many years because AES was fast, built into processors and really secure but vulnerabilities arose in the way browsers implemented the CBC mode of encryption. And it allowed attackers to determine private information that was encrypted on the browser side, but allowed things like cookie theft or session hijacking. One attack like that is called Beast. It's an attack back from uh, 2011. And another one is the Lucky, Lucky 13 attack from 2013. And there's some great presentations out there on those that you should look up and watch if you're interested. The StreamCypher RC4 was used as a way to mitigate both of these vulnerabilities, at least until a patch came out or a, a constant time implementation could be found in the case of Lucky 13. Lucky 13. Uh, but RC4, of course, was not devoid of problems. There was some, there was a, a whole series of serious SSL security citations surrounding RC4 starting in 2013 and stopping finally in 2015 with the no more attack, which again follow, allowed attackers to reveal private data about the encrypted text. And by themselves, modern encryption and decryption constructs are excellent at protecting data. They take data in, put random data out with no way to get back to the original without the key. But because of that, there's no clear way to tell if the data being decrypted has been modified since it was encrypted. And a lot of those attacks that I just described involve the ability for an attacker to re-inject encrypted blocks or inject specific blocks into the data stream for the receiving end to decrypt. And after the receiver decrypted the data, it would then go and check a checksum to make sure it was correct. But the timing of that check or and the rejection or non-rejection of the decrypted data sent a signal back to the attacker, allowing them to glean information about the nature of the plain text. And, and for this reason, modern encryption was modernized. Authenticated encryption was designed to detect intentional, unauthorized modifications of the data, as well as accidental modification. In other words, to protect against attacks modifying the ciphertext. Encryption constructs using authenticated encryption started appearing in 2000 with research from IBM, universities, RSA laboratories. These contract constructs are specific ways to utilize an encryption cipher like AES to not only create ciphertext, but also a tag that authenticates what was sent by the sender. Now, there's several different ways to perform this authentication. And it's easy to think of it like a secure hash of the data. One way used by the original design of SSL and TLS is to put the authentication tag 
over the plain text and then encrypt both the plain text and the tag together. Another way is to do the opposite. You encrypt the text and then create an authentication tag from the encrypted value. The final way is to combine the two ideas and encrypt both the plain text as well as the authentication tag that created from the plain text. With any of these choices, upon decryption, if an authentication tag doesn't validate, then the decryption returns an error rather than the plain text. This is what's done in modernly modern cryptography. Now, unlike basic encryption functions that just take in a key and a plain text and output a cipher text, or even the slightly more advanced version that adds in an initialization vector, which is sometimes called a nonce or a number used once, authenticated encryption instead takes a plain text, a key, an initialization vector, and something called associated data. This associated data is used to calculate the tag, but it doesn't get it does not get encrypted. Then you can notice that the associated data doesn't go into that encrypt function. But what is associated data? Well, imagine sending a postcard with a message using authenticated encryption. You encrypt the message on the back of the card, but you still have the to and the from addresses in plain text. Otherwise, the postcard wouldn't arrive at its destination, and you wouldn't be able to receive replies sent to the, the from address. The issue is without us authenticated associated data, anybody can copy the message and the authentication tag in any number of times and do things like reroute it or change the from address to make it look like it was sent by somebody else. You'll know the message that you decrypted was correct, but you would think that it came from another source. Associated data as an input into the algorithm is used by internet protocols like TLS 1.3 or the quick method that Google started to make a faster version of TLS. And it's used to provide authenticated proof over the plain text portions of the protocols. With unauthenticated encryption, the decrypt function always outputs a block or a stream of ciphertext. It's up to the application to validate or, and reject bad data. With authenticated encryption, there's only two options for output, either the actual plain text or an error message saying that the input was bad. This error output will occur if somebody changes any of the inputs, the ciphertext, the tag, the initialization vector, or the associated data. And this ensures that the integrity of the plain text is maintained. Currently, one of the most widely used authenticated algorithms is AES-GCM. Now, this stands for Galois counter mode. And it refers to the way that large amounts of data are encrypted, the counter mode, and the way that it's authenticated using a Galois field in an algorithm. The method for creating this authentication tag using the Galois field, uh, it's just a mathematically defined group of a very, very large set of numbers with defined ways of performing mathematical operations to ensure that all the values and operations fall into numbers within the specific set. And it makes anything that would normally fall outside of the set wrap around to the start or to the end of the set, depending on the calculation. And you can see the, the function there on the screen. The input and the output for GCM are the same typical in and out that you'd expect from any authentication, authenticated encryption algorithm. The counter mode part, the CM of GCM, takes an AES block cipher and turns it into a stream cipher by repeatedly feeding the counter into that AES block. This means that AES in the GCM mode creates a, a strung together series of blocks of bits and then turns into a bunch of one-time pads, each one AES block size long, that then gets XORed with the plain text and the AES function output in the XOR of the plain text is stored off as a stream of ciphertext. But at the same time, that is fed back into a multiple, sorry, a multiplication function from the GAUA field. And each ciphertext block is multiplied by the previous one to create a small size, a small constant size value. And then that final block is ultimately XORed 
with a value that's created by encrypting the initialization vector and the key with the key. And this provides security for that final tag value because while anybody can multiply the ciphertext blocks together, only the key holder can do this final operation to seal the tag. Now remember the, the provably secure XOR encryption? With that, we can't reuse or loop or replay any part of the one-time pad because doing that can lead to a situation where you end up revealing the plain text. In the same way, GCM works by creating a pseudo-random pad. Same IV and the key used together will always create that same padding stream. That's great news though, because if you didn't, you wouldn't be able to decrypt any of the encrypted data given the same key. However, because of this, the randomness of the initialization vector is just important as the randomness in the key, and it's imperative that it's only used once. Otherwise, it's like reusing a one-time pad, and it destroys the security properties of the encryption scheme. And there were several recent vulnerabilities that I'll touch on later that have taken advantage of this. One of the other modernly modern cipher systems that's in heavy use today is called ChaCha20 with Poly1305. It's a descendant of the previously mentioned Salsa20 cipher. Uh, ChaCha20 is a, a stream cipher, and it's used to create a long pseudo-random string of bits that, by using a counter similar to the way that AES-GCM works with it. The authentication portion of this cipher, the Poly1305, it refers to the polynomial equation that's, creation, that's used in the creation of the authentication tag. While 1305 comes from the special prime number, 2 to the 130 minus 5, and it's used in the upward bound that, of the values that are done when performing the math using the tag polynomial, and it just wraps around to the beginning. So let's step through how ChaCha20 works. Um, in combination with the poly1305 accumulator that creates the tag. I wanted to create this diagram because I couldn't find anything online that went through the entire process in a visual format at this level. So the same way that ASGCM starts, you take the, the key, the IV, and the counter and feed it into the encryption function. Then as you continue, you wrap around the counter, start adding one to it using the same key and initialization vector to create an output stream that's the same size as whatever plain text you're trying to encrypt. That gets XORed with the plain text and becomes your ciphertext. After that, you take the ciphertext and the associated data and you put those two together with some padding and the length of those two things and make a, another buffer to push into the poly1305 algorithm. Now this is different from GCM because it actually uses a key to go into that poly1305. So you do this, you run through that in full encryption buffer through the tag generation method, and then that outputs the final tag value for ChaCha20. So this 1305 prime that's used for the tag generation it was chosen because it gives the ability to add optimizations in the way that the message is broken up to perform all the various cryptographic operations. In fact, almost all of the internal design of Poly 1305 lends itself to a very fast implementation. And this is an important consideration. If adding in authentication to encryption created a really large overhead and calculations or, or in the size, nobody would want to adopt it, and its use would be relegated to obscurity. And that brings us to one of the important considerations for choosing an authenticated encryption scheme, speed. AES has been around since the year 2000, and that means over the last 20 years, cryptographers, programmers, processor chip designers, they've all been diligently working to ensure that the overhead of performing encryption with AES isn't a significant detractor to its use and adoption. Chip designers have started including special registers and specific instruction sets in the microcode of their processors that allow for very, very fast performance of the different operations inside of AES. And this makes AES faster than ChaCha20 by a fairly good margin. 
at least on computers, they use that particular chip. Without it, however, ChaCha20 is actually superior. It was designed to be especially fast in software implementations without requiring any special hardware tricks. So phones and tablets and even some of the new laptops are able to encrypt using ChaCha20 much faster than they could do encryption with AES. Even still, that didn't stop processor implementers from trying. And in 2018, they introduced some new instruction sets on CPUs that could actually boost ChaCha20's implementation speed over the AES on a chip in some certain circumstances. ChaCha20 was designed to defeat the problematic side channels that plague AES implementations. Because of the way AES was designed, implementers had added in optimizations, but that could lead to issues. And when these timing issues happen, if an attacker is there looking closely at how long the operation performed, it can actually lead them to be able to divine the key, completely destroying the security of the protocol. But because of ChaCha20's design, all the operations happen in constant time and there isn't an opportunity for any timing attacks with the encryption. So, since I managed to sneak this in the weeds talk into a in the cloud slot, I figured I should probably talk a little bit about how this fits into the cloud. So we can go through some of the, the three big players in the cloud. Besides the transport layer encryption, there's two different use case, main use cases for encryption in the cloud. First, there's data at rest. And secondly, uh, I'll call encrypting application data. I'll differentiate between these two by saying data at rest is anything that's done automatically by the cloud provider uh, for all of one specific type or even all of the data that's stored by the cloud provider. And then application data, on the other hand, is where the cloud provider provides a specific interface for applications that are running on the services to use keys to encrypt data within their actual application code. So with data at rest in AWS, uh, it allows administrators to set up encryption for their stored data using AES GCM, which provides a nice authenticated option for them to use to protect all their data. GCP uses the same by implementing AES GCM to protect data at rest in their environment. Some added bonus material here. Uh, whenever Google sends data across their networks, they take that data instead of using TLS like other places. They have a special uh, optimized protocol that's specific to their environment called ALTS or ALTS. It allows them to transfer data using either AES GCM or a different algorithm that they made called AES VCM, which uses a special authenticated method, authentication method that's based on integer arithmetic. And it's designed to be especially fast on Google's 64-bit processors. Microsoft Azure, on the other hand, uh, it does use AES for data at rest storage, but disappointingly only uses the chaining block cipher mode. And they cite the reason for this as making the retrieval of the storage faster. On the application side, every cloud provider here has the has an API that lets application teams uh, to facilitate the encryption on specific pieces of data from their code that's running in the cloud. With AWS application data, similar to their data at rest, can be encrypted using AES GCM. The interface here allows for providing additional associated data, that extra non-encrypted data we talked about, as well as an initialization vector, but it's up to the developer to make sure that that's never reused and is always completely random. In Google's cloud, applications are given the ability to do something called envelope encryption. This encryption API allows developers to simply encrypt data by just passing a byte array and a key name. Under the covers, it uses GCM and a key management scheme designed by Google that uses a key encrypting key to protect the key that does the actual data encryption. The data encryption key and the initialization vector used are randomly generated on the fly anytime new data needs to be written. Azure, on the other hand, doesn't provide an API for symmetric encryption of data at all. 
it does provide an API that allows applications to create their own securely stored keys and then use them inside their application to encrypt data using any encryption methods supported by the programming language in use. Of course, the examples in their documentation use the chaining block cipher mode. But how does this protect you? See, the problem with encrypting data in the cloud is most people don't understand the threat model that it protects against. Cloud encryption doesn't protect against the cloud provider seeing your plain text data. They have to be able to decrypt the data so that they can store it, sort it, index it, provide it back to you. It also doesn't protect against operators setting permissions incorrectly on the data and the key where anybody could get access to it through a regular web interface or an application. This happened at Capital One about a year ago. They had 140,000 social security numbers and 80,000 bank account numbers accessed by uh, an attacker, even though they were all encrypted in the cloud. The reason was because the access rights were set on the data interface, allowed anybody hitting the cloud service to tell the provider and go get the keys and decrypt the data and then send it to them. So what does cloud, protect, cloud encryption even protect against? It prevents somebody with physical access to the hard drives from getting access to the raw data. You could achieve this access by breaking in and yanking drives out, finding unerased drives in the trash, however unlikely that would be, or by an insider working in the data center with access to the physical drives. Another way to use the cloud keying mechanisms to protect your data, it depends on the particular way that the crypto systems in the cloud are set up. Cloud administrators can do something called bring your own key or BYOK. This allows the admin to provide a key to the cloud from their local site. You'd want to do this if you are worried about the key persisting in the cloud after you didn't want it to, and trusted the cloud provider to delete copies of the key when asked. And cloud consultants pitch this as a way to quickly remove the provider's access to a given key or set of keys that renders the data unreadable. You'd want to do this after terminating a cloud agreement to make sure that they couldn't get to the data anymore, or to quickly destroy the ability to decrypt the data for whatever reason. A similar concept is called key caching. It's one step removed from that. And that's where every few minutes or hours, the cloud provider makes a call back to the local company's key server to request the key in order to perform cryptographic operations on the data. In an example not too far outside the realm of plausibility, given their access to the keys, a cloud provider could turn, out, turn over data without your knowing or intervention when faced with a court subpoena. However, if you knew that the request for the data was imminent and wanted to retain the ability to fight the subpoena to prevent the court from gaining access to it, you could revoke the cloud provider's access to the keys and with it prevent their ability to provide meaningful data. Another example where companies could use this cloud encryption is to help protect data using a more complex data access configuration. You allow specific users access to the stored encrypted data where they could see things like the location of the data and possibly plain text information about what the encrypted data is associated to, but then give the group access, another group access to the data as well as the ability to decrypt it. An example of this would be if a select group of people like doctors that needed to see images containing sensitive information like dental scans, and there were other users like office staff that needed to have the ability to see information about people that have had dental scans but don't need to see the actual images. Well, as long as the access rights to the keys are managed correctly, the data remains secure and protected. Now, everything we've talked about so far has been in place for the last five years or so, but of course, there's still some not using all of those best practices. Others are finding ways to work on the next best thing for encryption and bringing that into modern libraries, incorporating it into systems, utilizing cryptography. One of the things that you might have noticed is that AES GCM is extremely popular. It's used all over, 
browsers, in the clouds, and applications protecting important data for all types of uses for all types of people. One of the problems with AES is that not everybody with ASGCM is not everybody gets it right. Very similar to the way that people see AES and just jump on using it blindly in electronic codebook mode, GCM allows implementers to easily and hopefully accidentally shoot themselves in the foot. If the same initialization vector is used with the same key, but over different data, you end up in a situation where that data can be decrypted, even without knowing the key. And there are newer encryption constructs that haven't quite made it into the mainstream product lines yet, but they've been designed to help protect against this foot gun by changing the algorithm to where using the same initialization vector with the same key multiple times over different data doesn't affect the security properties of the encryption scheme as a whole. And one of these methods is called AES SIV. And rather than taking an initialization vector as input into the algorithm, it takes the plain text data and hashes it, and then that resultant hash is fed into a block cipher or a like AES as an initialization vector. And like GCM, a counter mode here is used for each new AES block that's created to deliver that pseudo random string that eventually gets XORed with the plain text. The Caesar competition began in 2014 and it wrapped up last year. It was designed to find a replacement for AES GCM that was both robust and suitable for mass adoption. And there were several categories of requirements, as you can see here, uh, and different algorithms were recommended based on the needs of the encryptor. And there's lots of different <laughs> algorithm names that probably haven't made it into anybody's lexicon quite yet. Um, but each of these categories here, it was either a equal choice to use both of them, just depending on which one you liked or which one happened to get implemented the best within the software, or it was a, a preferential ordering. So use this one first, or and if problems are found in that later, we can switch to this other one. One thing that's an ongoing process is something that's designed to help processors with in smaller devices or constrained environments to look at the algorithms that are used and then change the insides to make sure that they're, they take as little time and as few resources as possible. This search for the algorithm, this new type of algorithm is headed up by NIST or the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And it's currently ongoing and expected to complete over the next few years or so. Uh, it's been delayed a little bit uh, due to the current pandemic. Uh, the round three release of submissions is currently scheduled to come out in December. Homomorphic encryption is another encryption type, and it gives the ability to perform tasks or calculations over encrypted data. Technically, it's not new. It's been around since the 70s. It just hasn't seen much use until recently, and with good reason, because there's one little problem with homomorphic encryption. It's very, very processing intensive and can end up taking a long time to complete any operation in there. And there are several research institutions or and companies that have products and tools that support homomorphic encryption. IBM recently released, I think last week, one that works on both macOS and iOS. And they're going to be pulling out support for Linux and Android coming soon. Uh, last but not least is the reaction to the threat of quantum computing. And so quantum computing, by building these different types of computers, it can affect both symmetric algorithms and the asymmetric algorithms that are used in things like certificates and within TLS. And those asymmetric algorithms are hit a lot harder by quantum computing. 
So most of the focus has been on finding something to replace any encryption needs for new signing algorithms. So new types of certificates, new types of code signing, things like that. But there's another algorithm within uh, that was developed, I think back in the eighties, that also affects symmetric cryptography like we've been talking about today. Luckily, the, <laughs> this bit's easy. All you have to do to prevent the problem is double the encryption security level. In other words, take the minimum key size you have set for any of the symmetric algorithms and just move it up from 128 to 256. And now your decryption of the data is safe and protected from the, the threats of quantum computers. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I really hope that you've learned some new things about symmetric encryption and that your brain has been stretched a little bit or a lot and uh, that you have some questions that I can help answer. We encourage the uh, participants to uh, provide their questions on our Discord channel under the uh, track two. Uh, In the correct. clouds. Yep. So one of the questions is why does doubling the key size work for protecting the encryption types from quantum computers? So the, the reason for that is the particular algorithm that was developed by uh, the researcher, uh, his name was Grover. And the algorithm that's used to break symmetric encryption with a quantum computer ends up scaling at a rate that makes it to where doubling the key size prevents the attacks from taking place. So it, it works differently with the asymmetric algorithms that scales linear, linearly. And so any doubling of key sizes with asymmetric algorithms, you, you end up having to just increase the number of qubits in your quantum computer by one. So uh, next question, again, uh, quantum computers is if the issue is around prime factorization or if there's something else to it. So with, with symmetric cryptography, there's no prime numbers. Uh, with things like RSA that use prime numbers, the method to generate the private key is you come up with the biggest random number you can think of, make sure it's odd, and then start increasing that by two until you find a prime number. And the algorithm that was used for quantum computers to quickly factor prime numbers is why that's affected there. But since there's no prime numbers used in symmetric encryption, it doesn't have any effect here. The, the scale for breaking symmetric encryption using quantum, uh, you would have to uh, add qubits on a logarithmic scale in order to get up to the ability to break 256-bit encryption instead of at a linear scale like you would for asymmetric. Uh, another question is how to get the slides. I will post these on, on my website, cem.me, and I'll put a I'll put a blog post together that kind of goes through basically everything I talked about today, plus a little bit more. Cool. What other questions do you all have? Feel free to keep popping them in the Discord. All right, make sure uh, you also go check out the crypto challenge. It's on ctfscoreboard.bsidessatx.com. What would be some advice that you would give somebody uh, to kind of start those crypto challenges? Like what would be some things they need to think about or, or a mindset they have to go into it? So one of, the, one of the things you could do is take the clue and put the word cipher after it and throw that into Google 
and see what you come up with. That's a good way to find out what algorithm is used to do the encryption puzzles. And the clues are there on the CTF site. Hint, hint. <laughs> Um, all right, somebody also mentioned some of the, the content on my website. Uh, the, the big versions of some of the posters aren't available because I haven't updated my CDN. So yeah, I need, I need to work on that. Maybe there's another question about your thoughts on browser encryption. See, uh, browser encryption, there's actually some new developments in that where browsers have taken and make an, made uh, JavaScript versions of these algorithms. So you have a fast JavaScript implementation of AES GCM or ChaCha20, as well as asymmetric algorithms like ECDSA that are available there in the, in the browser for use to protect data. And this can be useful if you're making a, an application to do encryption for communication between two parties, or if you're trying to uh, store something locally in a safe manner. Um, otherwise, uh, the other browser encryption that, of course, everybody knows and loves is the TLS, which is a, a great way to protect your data as long as you configure it correctly. Carl, one of the questions that we received on Discord is asking, is it an appropriate takeaway that all the hype around quantum decryption doom is overblown? What are your thoughts on that? So it depends on the method that you're using for protecting the data. So one of the reasons that people are focusing on encryption, quantum algorithms now to prevent decryption or any cryptographic problems when quantum computers are available is the way specific algorithms work. For example, in TLS, you come to a key agreement for the data to be encrypted with. The problem is that key agreement happens with symmetric algorithms, and or sorry, it happens with asymmetric algorithms, which are highly brittle when exposed to quantum computers. So think about your Facebook logon for a computer or mobile device. When's the last time you entered in your password for Facebook or for Google? The authentication cookies that you're sending there are extremely long lived because the, the developers of those websites have decided that they don't wanna make people log in continuously. So because of that, we have really, really long lived sensitive data that's being run through algorithms like TLS. So if you take and store and capture data today that was encrypted with TLS and a quantum computer is developed later, they can go back to that data today that they kept and break that key agreement. They're not breaking AES, they're just breaking the, the way that the AES key is derived. Because of that, it puts that data that was sent today, even though it was encrypted with a really strong algorithm that's not vulnerable to quantum encryption, it allows them to decrypt that and get to the actual sensitive data. So it's not necessarily overblown, but you actually have to think of what the algorithm is, what type of data you're trying to protect with, and how you should best try to protect that data. I'm trying to pull up the uh, the right channel to send for the crypto puzzle to the other question in the chat here. You go there and look at the pinned messages on that channel. You'll get all the links that you need for the, the crypto puzzle. All right, another, uh, another question is uh, what hobbies I have outside of doing crypto stuff. Um, I, I enjoy music. I have a banjo here. It's fun to play. I also play a, a couple other <laughs> different instruments too. So I really enjoy that. Reading as well. Nobody ever expects this banjo. It's like the Spanish <laughs> Inquisition. 